Hi everyone, thanks for clicking on this video and whenever or wherever you're watching, I wanna personally thank you uh, for just spending a few minutes uh, with me as we just pause on a really uh, somber day and a day that is um, really important, I think, for us as a culture, as a country, uh, to stop and think about. It is really fascinating for me to pause and to realize that it has been 20 years uh, since 9-11 uh, and the terrorist attacks that really rocked our country and uh, really changed a lot of uh, who we are in many ways. I remember, uh, again, it was 20 years ago, so I'm 40, I was 20 years old, and I remember walking out of my dorm room and down the hall and some guys were gathered around the TV in the little lobby there and they said, hey, uh, and I was like, what are you guys doing? It was early in the morning, uh, of course, and they said a plane just hit one of the Twin Towers in New York. And I thought, whoa, that is crazy. And so like many of us, that moment of where we were and how we heard and what we saw is seared indelibly into our minds, into our, our consciousness. And, and so I remember sitting there for a few moments as reporters were scaling onto rooftops. And I remember specifically seeing George Stephanopoulos filming and, and uh, hearing all those different things. And then all of a sudden there was another plane. And of course the second plane struck the tower. And it was in that moment where I remember very vividly uh, in my own heart thinking pe people just died. And as a young man, I watched a lot of movies, and so it was easy to frame everything like that as fiction, but it was in that moment that reality really struck. I remember walking across the campus to one of my classes, I think it was a broadcasting class, and we sat there and we just talked, and uh, it was a really interesting time to um, reflect even in those initial moments. And of course, the day unfolded and the towers uh, collapsed, and thousands of people died and of course the plane crashed into the pentagon and then the paint uh, the plane uh, crashing uh, in pennsylvania it was just a day that really left all of us really rattled even as a 20 year old young man jen and i had just met and i was scheduled to fly out i think either wednesday or thursday and it took me several days as the airports were shut down and there were no planes flying but I ended up flying home that weekend. And for me, I was, I have been in hindsight 20 years later, thankful to the Lord for that kind of divine appointment. And uh, to be able to be with my family and to be with my home church. And it was a very interesting uh, Sunday. And many of those memories are kind of etched in my mind as well, as I'm sure for you, we all have our different memories and um, recollections of where we were and how we heard. Some of you may even have been. I have a friend who was in New York and um, his his uh, processing of that is, is very interesting. But I wanted to take a moment and just on the 20th anniversary, uh, just pause for a few minutes and look to God's word as we reflect on um, an event that shaped us as a nation, as a culture, and really changed us. Um, to pause and to think about uh, men and women who gave their lives. I was um, reading in articles, as I'm sure you have over the last a few weeks in preparation for the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And I was, um, I, I was just reminded that there are children whose parents never came home that day. And there are moms and dads whose sons and daughters didn't come home that day. And just to pause and to think about those folks and to pray for them and to really think about them and to be filled with gratitude for the sacrifice of their, their sons or their daughters or their moms or their dads. And then to remember that grief, as many of us know, um, is a tricky road. And even 20 years later, there is a still real visceral grief and sorrow and so just to pause and think about each of those folks and to be grateful for their sacrifice. But as a Christian, to ultimately look to God's word and to develop a, what we would call a biblical worldview, how we view things in the world and how we view uh, something like 9-11, a national tragedy. 
There's a story in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6. It's something that I love to go to. In Isaiah 6, the passage begins like this in verse 1. Isaiah says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. The passage begins with um, kind of a, a contextual note of where Isaiah is, maybe emotionally and where the society is. Isaiah says it was in the year that King Uzziah died. For many of us, that, that may just be something we skip past and get to maybe a part that is quickly applicable to us or something that's awe-inspiring. But that setting there that Isaiah begins with is really important to understand um, the awe that the next event inspires. It was in the year that a long-standing king had died. He had been a ruler, a prosperous ruler over the nation for more than half a century. And so there was really stability, there was peace, there was prosperity for people. And Uzziah sadly did not end his reign well. And it was in that year that this favored, beloved king died that God revealed and gave Isaiah an incredible vision. Isaiah says it was in the year that King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. He says the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he f covered his feet, with two he flew. One called to another and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah is describing, I mean, you can see him grasping at words to describe the vision. He says, the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Isaiah's next words, or his first words there, are, woe is me. He sees this awe-inspiring vision in the midst of a national tragedy, in the midst of a time uh, of great grief for his nation. And I think one of the most important things for us as Christians to both do and to lead others to is as we reflect on this tragedy, this tragedy that is now two decades uh, behind us, but still the, the remnants of it and how it has formed us is still very present. We, we must draw our attention to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who sits firmly on his throne. So often what happens is we are distracted. We are drawn to lesser things. And Isaiah, I'm sure, because he was human like us, was in grief, was in frustration, had questions about what the future of his nation was going to be. And it was in that moment that the awe-inspiring vision of the glory of God put all of those other things in their proper place. It gave genuine biblical um, perspective of that. Isaiah says, it was in that year that I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. And then he describes angelic beings calling back to each other, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, or holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. It was such a, a booming sound that the, the threshold, it felt like things were shaking. It was this kind of this earthquake. And then he says, the whole house, the whole place was filled with smoke. And he just looks around in complete terror. He says, woe is me. And seeing God in the time of his grief also helped him to see himself and his nation very clearly. Isaiah says, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. It was in that grief that God gave him this great vision of himself, of the Lord. And it was in seeing the Lord clearly for the very first time that Isaiah also saw himself clearly. He saw himself as a sinner. He said, I am lost, I am unclean, and the people that I dwell among have unclean lips because I have seen the holiness of the Lord. I've seen the purity and the glory of God that has been on display. 
And so in the middle of that tragedy of Uzziah's death, he saw the Lord and he also saw himself. There's a really confronting verse in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus is, as he does on many occasions, um, debating with and having a conversation with the religious leaders. And they're having, um, they're having somewhat of a debate about what defiles a person. And Jesus says it, it's not the external forces, it's not things on the outside that are the problem. It's, it's what's on the inside of every person. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 15, verse 19. He says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person. What Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6 was in the middle of that tragedy, he saw the Lord and he saw himself. And he saw himself as a sinner, as unclean. He did not look to other people and blame and try to establish himself as righteousness or, or, or sort of promote some self, sort of self-righteousness, you know, ego trip. He saw the Lord and he saw himself very clearly. And one of the things that we as Christians ought to do, and maybe you're not a Christian watching this, and so thank you for watching, but if you are a Christian, this is what we are supposed to do. And if you're not a Christian, I hope that you'll see what Christians are actually supposed to be doing according to the word of God. We're supposed to be, uh, first as Jesus talked about, taking care of the log in our own eyes so we can deal with the speck in someone else's eye. Because we all have these struggles. We all have a fallen nature. We have a, a flesh as the scripture calls it. Jeremiah says the heart is deceitfully wicked. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? It goes beyond. So what Jesus is revealing here is what happens, what, what causes devastation and sin is, is our own hearts. And that's where that proceeds from. It's interesting that Jesus uses the first word there. He says, out of the heart come evil thoughts and murder. It's, it's, it's from the fallen heart of man. And Isaiah, Isaiah saw that. Here he was, the prophet of God, the voice for God in his generation and he realized the depth of his depravity. He realized his sin. And so there he is with this vision of the glory of God, recognizing he does not belong, uh, recognizing that he is, this is other, this, this is holy and he is fallen. But this is what the grace of God does. In verse six there of Isaiah, Isaiah says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Here was atonement. Here was cleansing being brought about by the Lord. In the middle of this tragedy, as we reflect 20 years later, it is important for us to be drawn to the glory of God. It's important for us to be honest and to go to the Lord as Psalm 139 says and say, search me, oh God, know me, try me, see if there's any wicked way in me. I need you to lead me in the way everlasting, David writes and prays there in Psalm 139. So we need to, in the midst of this as, as, as Christians, draw our attention and help draw other people's attention to the glory of God and who God truly is, that he rules and reigns over the universe. He sits securely on his throne, but we also need to be genuine and honest about our own brokenness, about our own sinfulness, about our own, and this is a heavy word, but our own wretchedness. But that brings us to the gospel. That brings us to the hope that God has made a way for our sins to be atoned for, our sins to be forgiven. In, in the middle of this, what the world does not need, the world does not need patriotic Christians. There's nothing wrong with loving America. I was talking to my kids this week, telling them how thankful I am to have been born in America and the incredible privileges that we have here. But what the world needs is, is not more patriotic sermons or patriotic songs or patriotic Christians. What the world needs is, is gospel-centered Christians, truly gospel-minded and, and Christians that are on mission for the gospel in the sense that 
we see this tragedy and we reflect on this tragedy and we want to draw people's attention as Isaiah does in Isaiah 6 to the glory of God and how that God has made a way through Christ for sinners like you and me to be saved, to be redeemed, to be transformed. That, that, is, that is the hope, that's the, that's the power of the gospel that we proclaim the death of Jesus as the atoning sacrifice for our, cross, or for, for our sin on the cross. We call it the substitutionary atonement, meaning he took our place, he's our, our substitute. We're the sinner, he's the sinless. We're the broken, he is the holy, righteous lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so we need to proclaim the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus as the hope for the world, as the, as the anchor in the midst of the brokenness that we see. That if they come to Christ and they repent of their sin and believe in Jesus, they are saved. They become citizens of heaven. That's what we need to do. And it's interesting that you see Isaiah, his sins atoned for, and then, just like I mentioned, he says, I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Now, we just heard a speech from the president several days ago that uh, used this verse. And I certainly don't mean to be critical to our president, but that was not the context of Isaiah chapter six. Thankful for American soldiers and uh, servicemen and women and the sacrifice that they make. But this is not what is being talked about here. It is the glory of God on display. It is the sin of Isaiah very clear to himself. It is the atoning work of God that God dispatches his son to provide a way for our sins to be washed away. And then he says, who will go for us? Who will I send into the world to do what? To proclaim this message to proclaim the glory of God and to proclaim the sinfulness of man and to proclaim the atoning work of God. He says, who shall I send and who will go for us? Then Isaiah said, here am I, send me. That's what the world needs. And I wanna to return to that point. That is what we as Christians are meant to be doing. And it started for Isaiah and Isaiah six as a tragedy in the year that King Uzziah died, what did I do? I, my attention was drawn to the glory of the Lord. In doing so, I really saw myself and my people so clearly, and I saw the gospel. I saw the grace of God. I saw the atoning mercy of a sovereign Lord who would send Christ to die for our sin, to rise from the dead. And it was seeing that that led Isaiah to a passion to go back to his people. When God asked, who shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah said, here am I, please send me. What you have done for me has been such an incredible act of grace and mercy. I am so thrilled to go and be the voice of God to my people to proclaim this good news. So on this day of um, national really mourning, because that's what it is, um, we as Christians, we pause and we need to be thankful for men and women who sacrifice their life, but we need to make sure that we are drawn to higher and holy things, to the kindness and the glory of God, a humility about our own brokenness, our own weakness, our own sin, and then coming back to the gospel as the singular, the sole hope for people. You know, as I pause now, I was a young man when 9-11 happened. I was, as I said, 20. And in those moments you process, maybe you've experienced this, maybe in a movie you watch you, when you're single, you watch it as a single person. Or when you're newly married, you watch it as a newly married person. And when you have kids, you watch it now as a father or as a mother. When you're a grandparent, you watch it with a different angle. And I really realized that that's how we view certain things. When I was 20 years old, I, I just wanted to get back to my girlfriend who was gonna shortly thereafter be my fiance and then seven months later be my wife. I just wanted to get back to her. And now 20 years later, we have five kids who were not alive uh, during 2001. And so here I am now as a father reflecting back on what happened in 2001, on September 11th, and then trying to explain that to my kids. 
And I just want to leave you with this, this kind of this bit of hope. There is a passage in the book of Job, and Job is in incredible grief and sorrow. And he says this, Job chapter 19, verse 25, he says of God, and notice Isaiah draws people's attention to God, and Job draws people's attention to God, and it's, it's all about the glory of God. It's, they're, he's, they're not drawing attention to themselves as really even inspirational figures. They're, they're just this gigantic conduit to point people to the Lord. Job 19 says, for I know, Job says, declares, testifies, that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. Job had this great confidence in who God is, who God was, and who God is, that he's the Redeemer. And for me, as I pondered making this video and thinking through the purposes of it, I wanted to draw Christians' attention to the glory of God, to their own sinfulness, to the gospel, to the forgiveness that we've experienced, but then also to the mission that we're on. And I believe one of the incredible characteristics of who God truly is, is he is the redeemer. He takes broken things and families and situations and people, and he is the redeemer. He buys it back. He is has this incredible sovereign ability to do that. He, he and he alone is the redeemer. It's what the gospel is, that he takes us broken sinners and he redeems us and rescues us and calls us his sons and daughters. He calls us his children. It's amazing that we could be adopted into the family of God because of the work of Christ. But also we can take great hope that national tragedies can be redeemed. That God in his kindness and in his grace and in his sovereignty can redeem even the most horrendous acts of violence and terror and cruelty. And that is what we need to declare. We need to declare who God is because that is what people need right now. And that is what people need tomorrow. And in a decade and in a hundred years or however long we have, that is what people need. They need believers who are declaring the genuine, true, redeeming, saving character of God and how he came in Christ. And Christ died for our sins while we were yet sinners, the Bible says, Christ died for us. And so if you're a Christian watching this, I hope that you'll be encouraged today that you'll be anchored by the gospel, but maybe you're not a believer. And I wanna say genuinely thank you for watching this. My hope, our hope, is that you would know Christ, that God loves you, that he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for your sin. Sin is a violation against God. If we take our lives and compare it to the 10 commandments, just a summary of the law, we, we've broken the law, we've sinned against God, we violated his holiness. And so we can say like Isaiah, woe is me, I'm undone, I'm broken, I'm unclean, I've, I've sinned against God. But God in his great mercy and God in his great grace loves us. He sent his only begotten son to die in our place on the cross. God punished Jesus because of sin and he punished Jesus for our sin. The Bible says in 1 John that he is the propitiation, meaning the payment, for our sin and not ours only, but the sin of the whole world. And so Jesus dies on the cross for our sin, rises from the dead. And in this moment, wherever you're watching or wherever you're listening to this, he is offering to you the forgiveness of your sins through the work of Jesus. And he is offering to you the gift of eternal life through his powerful triumphant resurrection from the dead. Romans 10, 9 simply says that if you'll confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll be saved from the eternal consequences of your sins and you'll be transformed. You'll be renewed, you'll be made new, and you will be transferred, the Bible says, from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his blessed son and the kingdom of light. You'll be con called from darkness into his marvelous light. That's the beauty of the gospel. And so my prayer for us today as Christians is that we will be beacons of the gospel more than ever before 
that we will grieve and weep with those who weep, will not ignore national tragedy or sorrow that people are in or grief in any form, but that we will seize with great gentleness and great respect and great love all of those opportunities to introduce people to the great Redeemer, Jesus Christ. So thanks for listening. I, th I appreciate you just taking a few moments and um, I'm honored that you would uh, spend a, just a couple uh, minutes together as we look at God's word on an incredibly uh, memorable and uh, important day. Have a good one. God bless you.